Well, good morning and Merry Christmas or Merry Christmas Eve. Everybody, we're thank you, thankful that you're with us. I'm Father Chris Alar. Uh, it is an honor to have you with us. Uh, we've gotten a ton of snow here. My car thermometer said 14 degrees. I don't know if that's accurate or not. And so we didn't think we'd have anybody here, but we got some great people who showed up. We got uh, Lizette and Shane who came all the way, drove two and a half hours to get here in the snow and flew in from California. So praise be to God that we have a great, great people here. And, and actually, God bless Brother Mark. Uh, everything that the devil wants to end here, um, we got locked out of the choir loft and Brother Mark couldn't get back in to the choir loft. It got The battery went dead on the lock. He couldn't get in. So he gets a ladder and climbed up the top of the choir loft, jumped up into the choir loft to get up. So many, many blessings to all of you who are part of this, uh, trying to get this broadcast. So God bless you. Uh, let us begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask through the grace of the incarnation, the word made flesh, that you will give us so much mercy and grace this season to turn from our ways, to leave behind vices, embrace the virtues, and imitate Christ our Lord through the example of Mary the disciple. We ask that this be, for those who go without, especially in this Christmas season, that this be a time of consolation. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So as you can see, we have an absolute um, perfect topic for today. It is the incarnation, the meaning of it. Why did God become man? And this is so important. So the meaning of the incarnation is what we're going to be talking about today. And so we have so many opportunities to just, you know, talk about Christmas for gifts and material things. Let's talk about the real meaning of the incarnation. Why did God become man? And actually, there's four reasons, not just one. In fact, all the preaching I have done usually focuses on one reason God became man. There's actually four. And so we'll talk about that. So anyway, the, the word incarnation, what is it? It's Latin for to put on flesh. To put on flesh, it's Latin. So now, the biggest, there's all kinds of scripture passages that can defend the incarnation, but let's, let's pick the two biggies, actually the three, right? The next slide of Brother Mark could show is John 1.14. That's one you all know. The word became flesh. And made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh. That's the one we always hear. Now, the next one is John 3.16. In my example, probably the second most known passage in all of Scripture behind Genesis 3.15. What is John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish but may have eternal life. Now, John 3, 16, my first exposure to it was a little kid watching football with my dad. Let's go to our next slide. Do you remember this? Sadly, they have basically stopped. But the guy with the big rainbow afro hair would go to all the Super Bowls and World Series, and they would always hold the sign, there it is on your screen, John 3.16. There is a picture of a football game, the Lions football game, go Lions, that they had a big John 3.16. You don't really see it anymore. When I was growing up a kid in the 70s, it was at every game. And so the meaning of that is probably the second most well-known meaning in all the scripture. This is important because God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. That's proof of the incarnation. But I like probably the most famous Genesis 3.15, where God, after the fall, gives us the promise of a savior and the gift of a mother. And that promise of a savior is Jesus Christ. That promise and a gift, the two most important verses in the Bible, in my opinion. I think all of John 6 is in one way, but John 3.16, Genesis 3.15. Powerful. All right, now, let's talk about this. What's interesting is even within the church, there's room to have differing opinions, as long as your opinion does not go against the teachings of the church. Let's talk about the Franciscans. All right, God bless the Franciscans. There are many, many great Franciscans. Some, eh, we need to pray for. 
But the Franciscan view overall, this is kind of surprising because there's differing views. Dominicans differ from the Franciscans. The Franciscans say that the only reason for the incarnation being redemption is wrong. The Franciscans say that it is not the only reason for the incarnation. It was not just because man sinned. Had man sinned, Christ would have come anyway. Now that differs. It's not what Aquinas necessarily said. Okay, why? Why did they say this? Well, St. Paul said everything was created for God. He wants to reveal himself to us and to be part of him in a greater way than what we knew him in the garden. So God wants us to be part of him in a greater way. So even without the fall, he wanted to bring us up to a higher level that we knew in the garden, then we knew in the garden. So the primary purpose of the incarnation, according to the Franciscans, is self-revelation, the revelation of God, and communion. It's not even redemption. I kind of looked at that as I was going through this on the plane, and I was like, whoa. But it's not contrary. Because there's actually four reasons according to the catechism. So the Franciscans focus on two of them and the Dominicans focus on the other two. I think they're all right. Now, instead of thinking of it after we sinned, God had always planned to become incarnate according to the Franciscans. All right. Had Adam and Eve never sinned, Jesus would still have become incarnate. Why? To divinize creation. To make it part of God, to bring it to a higher level. This is fascinating. So, was the incarnation necessary? Was it necessary? Okay, it wasn't in the strictest of sense. God could have saved us anyway. He could have just waved his hand from heaven. Didn't necessarily need to become a man to save us. So, in that strictest sense of necessity, he didn't have to become incarnate. However, It was necessary in a way because it was the best way. It was the most fitting way. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about St. Anthanasius. This guy, you probably don't hear a lot. You probably recognize the name, but you may not hear a lot. But I tell you, this guy saved Christianity. Okay, why? God, he said, you know this, you've heard this. God became man so that man could become God. Now, when members of Islam hear that, or even the Jews hear that, they're like, whoa, wait a minute. That's heretical. That's blasphemy. Actually, we don't mean when God became man so that man could become God, meaning a member of the Trinity. We're not saying we become members of the Trinity. What we are saying is that he divinized our flesh so that we can now participate in the divine life of God. Heaven. That's why Jesus opened the door to it. Now, he, Jesus now, didn't stop being God to become man. This was a heresy. Here's one for you. Was Jesus Christ a human person? 99.99% of Catholics will say yes. The answer, no. Jesus is not a human person. Father, that's blasphemy. No, Jesus is a divine person with a human nature. He already had his divine nature. He was always from all eternity a divine person with a divine nature. Now he's that same divine person come to earth in the flesh and assumes a human nature. So Jesus is one person, two natures, not two persons. One person, that person is divine. He already had a divine nature. Now he assumes a human nature. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Now, As a divine person, he took onto himself a human nature to unite to his divine nature. So basically, the second person of the Trinity always had a divine nature. Now when he's born of a woman, he assumes a human nature. What's he doing? He's uniting God, the divine nature, with man, the human nature, all in himself. This is a physical, literal union of divinity, God, and humanity, man. That is called the hypostatic union. Now I'm taking you back to seminary. Uh, By the way, the class you're attending today is Christology. (laughs) My favorite class. Um, So this here is what's going on. Now, as a divine person, he did this. Why did he take on human nature? To redeem it. 
So that part is correct. All right? In taking our flesh to himself, he divinizes it. He makes it new. He repairs it. What do you do when something's broken? You repair it. Jesus repaired human nature. Doesn't mean we're not still fallen. We still have concupiscence. But he repaired it so that we could be united back to God. Let's look at our next slide. This is St. Athanasius. Now, he was there at Nicaea. A lot was going on in Nicaea, right? He was there and he defined the incarnation. Why? To battle Arianism. You've probably heard of Arianism, one of the biggest heresies in history. And St. Athanasius helped define the incarnation to battle this. This was the most critical time of Christianity in our history because they were trying to define Jesus. Using scripture, so don't say, oh, it's all about some man-made declaration. No, it's through the guidance of the Holy Spirit based on scripture. Now, if Jesus, here's the point. If Jesus was not God, then we can't be saved because only God has the power to be saved. We can't save ourselves. God does the saving. So therefore, Jesus had to be God. We need a higher power to fix our brokenness. But if Jesus wasn't human, then he couldn't have died to be saved. So we needed both God to save us and the man to be saved. So for man to be saved, he had to die. So God the Father in his infinite wisdom says, how can I have man die but let him live? The resurrection. This is the amazing part of our faith. So, you know, I, I heard this good example. I was online doing some research last night, and it was um, used a refrigerator on one of these videos. And it said, can a broken refrigerator fix itself? No. A broken refrigerator can't fix itself. Cannot fix itself. Who can fix it? Well, someone must come from the outside of the refrigerator and fix it. To get into the refrigerator to break it apart, to get in there. You know who the best one is to do that? The one who made the refrigerator. I can't fix the refrigerator. I, it's one talent I don't have. I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm an industrial engineer. We were all just about efficiency and layouts. When we needed electrical done, we called the electrical engineers. So who's best able to fix that refrigerator? The one who made it, the one who designed it. Guess what, everybody? Who made us? Who designed us? God, who's best to fix us? God. All right, so we can't fix ourselves because we didn't make ourselves. Now, God from heaven could have declared us fixed. Like I said, he could have waved his finger, you know, but then we would have only been declared fixed, right? However, let's look at our next slide. Instead, he, being God, came down from heaven and fixed us from within. Remember I said the refrigerator? The guy's got the, 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 the to get into the refrigerator. He's got to stick his head in there. He's got to tear it apart. That's what God did. He stuck his head into a, into a human body and, and fixed us. He became one of us. God humbled himself to become a man, entering into our dysfunction so that he could fix us from the inside. It's perfect. This was Athanasius. All I'm telling you is not my view. Everything I'm telling you right now, St. Athanasius. Even though they didn't have refrigerators back then. So this is him. This is what we have in the creed. When every day, every Sunday you pray the creed, that's St. Athanasius. All right? The Arians were so mad they wanted to kill him for it. They wanted to kill him. Let's take a look at the next slide. This is St. Athanasius on the right. All right? I'm sorry, uh, he's on the, um, uh, Arius is on the right. So this is St. Arius on the right. He's the heretic. Who's slapping him there, pulling his beard? That's Santa Claus. St. <laughs> Nick. St. Nicholas was at Nicaea too. This was the fourth century. So that's a picture of St. Nicholas giving it to Arius, calling him a heretic. So Athanasius was there, giving it to him. St. Nicholas was there, giving it to him. And so this heretic, um, his beliefs, though, weren't uncommon. Now, what was Arianism? I don't want to go into all this, but you need to know this because these are the types of things that are creeping back into the world today. A belief that, ah, he really wasn't God. 
All right, what was the belief? Okay, Arius believed, Arianism, that Jesus was this kind of quasi-divine person, this quasi-human person. You know, Arianism said that the Son was created by the Father. Jesus was created by the Father and entered into this human shell. That he was not fully God. The son could not be fully God. He was God, but a lesser God. Like a small g God. And instead, Arian, uh, uh, Athanasius put our Christianity on the right track, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So let's look at our next slide. This is it. This is the, this is the hypostatic union. Notice what's on there. Jesus Christ, one person. And that person was divine. And in that one person is two natures. One human, one divine. Now they came together in one person. That's the hypostatic union. Now, what is a nature? What is a person? Okay. Now we're taking you back to seminary, we're taking you back to Christology. All right. A person is who I am. So I as a person am Father Chris. That is different then Shane or Lizette or Postulant that we have here, Alex and Postulant Paul. We are different in that sense. We are different persons. We are different persons. My person is Father Chris. Their person is Postulant Alex, Brother Mark. That is the who we are. But a nature is what we are. We all share human nature human nature. That's the what I am. I am a human. So who I am, I'm a person. What I am, and, the, and every person is different. It's basically my soul. Who I am is a person. So Jesus is one person, and that person was divine. Jesus Christ is not a human person. You can't have two persons in Jesus. You have four people in the Trinity. You'd have God the Father, he's one person. God the Son, he's one person. God the Trin uh, Holy Spirit is one person. There's only three persons of the Trinity. If Jesus Christ was two persons, human person and divine person, there'd be four persons in the Trinity. Instead, he is a divine person and always has been, who always had a human nature, divine, he's God. Then he assumed a human nature. He shared in our humanity, but he wasn't a human person walking around. He was God. He was a divine person. That's why when Mary gave birth, you don't give birth, birth to a nature. We'll talk about this next week. You give birth to a person. Who did Mary give birth to? The person of Jesus Christ. And that person was the divine person of the second person of the Trinity. She didn't create him. And that person is God. So we can call Mary the mother of God. So Jesus is the one who, as the second person of the Trinity, he had one who and two what's. <laughs> All right, so who's the who? The divine person, the second person of the Trinity. What are the two what's? Human nature, divine nature. So again, Jesus is one who, the second person of the Trinity, divine and two what's, one human nature, one divine nature. It made him both God, fully God, and fully human. So I always say this, please don't say Father Chris said Jesus wasn't human. He was human in his nature. He assumed a human nature. He was fully God, fully man in everything but sin. All right, now, Mary, as I said, gives birth to the who and not the what. So she's the mother of God because that's who Jesus was, the divine person. So the divine person who always existed, always had a divine nature, assumed this human nature. He is not a divine person and a human person. He's just a divine person, all right, with a human nature. God didn't turn into a creature. He assumed creatureness. Does that make sense? That's where Christology, your mind, as you're sitting in class, you know, and I was in seminary years ago, and I was sitting there thinking, how do I explain this to, to people? So I got out the seminary notes, worked with, with uh, uh, some other people, Chris Parks and others, and sat down and put this together. So he took human nature to use for his purpose. Why? To unite it to the divine nature. 
so we could have divine life. All right, now, as God, he becomes a creature in his nature, right? To unite it with the divine nature. That's what we have in the nativity, all right? Now, God uses his, Jesus' humanity as a visible form of the invisible God. That's why the Holy Father said, when you look at the divine mercy image, I don't know if Brother Mark can show that real quick, but if Brother Mark can show the divine mercy image, you're actually beholding the face of God the Father. Because God the Father's mercy, or the mercy of God the Father, God the Father's mercy, if you could encapsulate it, if you could incarnate it, you have the image of divine mercy. So this visible God has taken the form, or this visible person has taken the form of the invisible God, or I should reverse that. The invisible God has taken the form of a visible person. Beautiful. Why? Why did he do this? To fix us. All right. Thomas Aquinas said, why did God become human? Now we're getting into the four reasons. You always hear me talk about one. There are four. And so Thomas Aquinas said, was it fitting? Now, was it fitting that God became a man? It depends on who you ask. If you ask the Jews, they would say no. If you ask the Muslims, they would say no. Why would the Muslims say no? They said, the Muslims would say any incarnation would not be in line with the transcendent God and his sovereignty. He's so far above us, he would never condescend to become one of us. So was it Fitting that God became man, not according to these other religions. So yes, not all religions are the same. They are different. Only in Christianity did God become a man. The Muslims, again, would say no, an incarnation would not be in line. Because God would never do that. It would give the wrong idea about who God is. So St. Thomas Aquinas Stress, yes, he would become a man. Why? Because it shows his goodness, the goodness of God that comes in four ways. I always love the big four. I always call everything the big four. The big four plenary indulgences, the big four things to do when your loved one has left the church. We've done talks on all those. Let's talk about the big four reasons why God became man. I didn't make this up. It's right out of the catechism. But all of you, have you read your catechism today? If not, I'm bringing it to you. Here we go. Number one. Let's look at the next slide. Brother Mark can put it up. Number one, to reconcile us to God. That's the big one. That's the one I always talk about. Basically, he bridged the unbridgeable gap. All right? <clears throat> he, God, is the only being who could bridge that gap that was created between God and man because of sin. Sin was so great. Man created such a problem it was too big for man to fix it. Only God could fix it. Only God had the power to fix it. But you heard me say a couple weeks ago, but God didn't break it. So it's not just that God fix it. It's just that man fix it. Because man's the one who broke it. But the problem is, man doesn't have the power to fix it. Only God has the power to fix it. But if God didn't break it, and man broke it, how's man going to fix it? when man doesn't have the power to fix it. Hence, the God-man, both God and man, Jesus Christ. So the first reason he became incarnate, reconcile us to God. He gave us access to the Father again. He bridged the gap. He healed the wound. Next, number two, to prove his love for us. Number two, to prove his love for us. God didn't need to know what it was like to be one of us. He didn't need that. But we needed to know how much he cares for us. He needed to show us that he loves us and hasn't forgotten it, gotten us. It was to prove to us that he has not abandoned us. After the sin in the garden, what did Adam and Eve do? They ran. They didn't have any trust. And the catechism tells us the basic sin in the garden was a lack of trust. All right. This is God showing he hasn't forgotten us. He hasn't forgotten us. All right, he loves us to the point of death. You know, I heard this the other day. This is cute. One of the kids told me this at, uh, when I was doing um, confirmation. How much does God love us? This much. 
Now, what about position am I in? On the cross. Isn't that cool? How much does Jesus love you? He loves you this much. This is a parent, right? Now, a parent would say to their kid, if their kid asked him how much they love him, I love you this much. That means I'm willing to die for you. It's not coincidental to me that Christ died with those arms outstretched like this, that Christ died on the cross in this position, because this is how much he loves us. I'm like, wow, that's cool. All right, so now, he loves us so much, that's how much. All right, number three, why did Jesus die on the cross? To reveal to us what holiness is. An example, how to live, how to love. Not just love your favorite people, love everyone, even your enemies. He was the model. As he loved, we are called to love. <clears throat> and then fourth, to be partakers in divine nature. To make us partakers in divine nature. God became man so that man could become God, we just said. All right, so how does this happen? In baptism, we now become shares in the divine nature. This is why please get your children baptized. Divinity now lives in us because of the baptism through Jesus. And only Jesus makes that possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. We become adopted sons of God, sons and daughters. We become adopted sons and daughters of God. This is why Jesus is our brother. We have God our father, Jesus is our brother. Doesn't it make sense we need Mary as our mother? Yeah. And so it is Jesus, you know, that's why um, St. Augustine used to say, oh, happy fault after the fall in the garden. Why? Because now we're elevated to a higher level than we were before the fall. Before the fall, yeah, we had preternatural gifts. We didn't get sick. We didn't, we didn't get COVID. But now we're elevated to be united with God. Absolutely fascinating. So salvation is not just about forgiveness of sins. I'm the first one after I was putting all this together, reading my notes, going back in books, doing talks or, or um, uh, listening to talks, going through the catechism. I realized I focused way too much on salvation only being about the forgiveness of God. That is key. That's number one. But there's three other big reasons to prove his love for us, to reveal us how to be holy and to become partakers in the divine nature. Amazing. So sin and the forgiveness of sins, acquittal, that's part of it, but it's not all of it. You know, I heard this on, on uh, a talk. Sin is like taking a board and driving a nail into it. Kind of ironic, right? That's the cross, right? Take a wood and drive a nail into it. What is that? That's like sin. Now, when God forgives the sin, what does he do? Doesn't he pull that nail out? Doesn't God, when you go to the confessional, you're forgiven of your sins, doesn't God pull that nail out? Yeah, that's the forgiveness of sins. But what's left in the wood? The hole. The hole. The hole remains. It's got to be fixed. So salvation is not just about removing the nail, but it's about filling that hole. It's about being reconciled back to God. This is why we don't call it the sacrament of forgiveness, even though it is. What do we call it? The sacrament of reconciliation. It means God just doesn't forgive us, but he brings us back to him in a better way. All right? Sacrament of reconciliation is not just about forgiveness. It's about reconciliation. That's why we call it the sacrament of reconciliation. It's about becoming a child of God in Christ. God then loves us as he loves his only begotten son. This is fascinating. The question isn't about what is the least I can do to avoid hell? You know, I went through a long period of my life. When I got out of college, I started, started wondering, and then I moved down to North Carolina. I'm out of college now. I, I, I worked in the corporate world. Then I moved down to North Carolina, and I, I got my business, and all of a sudden I started, well, that's the purgative way. I started wondering, what's the least I need to do to get out of hell? What's the least I could do? Just to, just to avoid hell. That's the purgative way. 
You become holy just to avoid hell. But then you've got to get up to the, the next level, the illuminative way, which is there's something good in me, heaven. I want to be good because I want to be the joy of heaven. But then the highest level is the unitive I want to be good and holy just for the glory of God. Nothing to do with my goodness or lack of punishment. If you want to hear that talk, I did a talk a couple of weeks ago on the, on the dark night of the soul on that. So this is it. The question isn't about how to avoid hell. How much of the divine life do you want? That's the question. How much of the divine life do you want? You're either going to have a thimble in heaven this big or you're going to have one this big. And if you got this big, if you want a thimble this big in heaven, you got to die. You got to die to yourself in this world. Now, if you want to get to heaven through the purgative way, yeah, you can make it, but you're going to have just a little container this big. The point is both are completely full. So if I skated in just out of fear of hell, I got a container this big. My soul is a container this big. It's still full. I'm completely happy. I am completely happy. But if I'm willing to die to myself so that I have a container this big, that's completely filled. So the question is, how filled do you want to be? How filled do you want to be? This is it. Jesus is more than just about being good and avoiding evil. Confucius or Plato could teach you how to do that. Right? Right? He assumed our human nature. He assumed all the defects. He went through hunger. He went through thirst. He went through pain. He went through death. This all comes from sin. They didn't have this in the garden. They didn't have hunger, or thirst, pain, or death in the garden. This came from sin. So now Jesus is taking that on, all right, to atone for our sins. So on the cross, Jesus took the covenant curse that we all deserve. That's amazing. Now, right now, we're, we're half done. We're, we're half done. We're going to show a quick video. It's two, about two, two, two and a half minutes long. This is a great example. I went through dozens and dozens and dozens of videos to get you a little two-minute best example I've heard of the explanation of the incarnation. So let's take a look at it, and it talks about what we just mentioned. This is a clip on the incarnation. Central to the doctrine of the Incarnation is the belief that Jesus was both fully human and fully God. Or to put it another way, Jesus had both a human nature and a divine nature. This makes him a unique being. God the Father has a divine nature, but not a human nature. You and I have a human nature, but not a divine one. Jesus of Nazareth had both a divine nature and a human nature. To put it another way, the incarnation means that Jesus is the meeting point or intermediary between God and human beings. Jesus had a full human nature and experienced all the normal elements of human life except without sin. He felt hunger and thirst, he felt compassion, he felt fear, and ultimately he suffered and died. In the Gospels, Jesus is often referred to by the title Son of Man. This phrase had two possible meanings. On some occasions, it is used by Jesus to refer to an ordinary human being. However, on other occasions, it is used to refer to a human being who is given God's power and authority. Jesus uses the term in this second way when he refers to his impending execution. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be killed and after three days rise again. Mark 8.31 In this way, by identifying the suffering he was to face, Jesus recognises his human nature if he were not human, he would not be able to suffer. Jesus also had a truly divine nature. Because he was truly God, he had God's power and authority to forgive sins, to heal the sick, and resurrect the dead. In the Gospels, we also see Jesus referred to as the Son of God. The most notable instance of this was in Jesus' trial before the Jewish High Council, also known as the Sanhedrin. Again, the High Priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Mark chapter 14, verses 61 to 62. The phrase, Son of the Blessed One, is as close as we can get to Son of God, since Jewish people would not have said the name of God out loud, and so often replaced the word God with other phrases, such as the Blessed One. Jesus' answer, I am, is also a clue to his divinity, 
since it is a form of the name that God uses in the Old Testament to identify himself to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Jesus here confirms that he is God, and it is for this reason that he is crucified. Okay, so that's a great little quick clip to show you what seminary is like. That is the kind of topics we discussed in our Christology class. Who is Jesus? Divine nature, human nature, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's a beautiful little summary. So let's now get a little bit deeper into the incarnation. Uh, A couple days ago, I did a homily on the incarnation, and I I, I think there were some points there. If you heard this, it, it, it may be a good refresher, but this is the only time I mentioned it was just a few weeks ago, and I'd like to reiterate a couple of those points just for the next few minutes, and then we're gonna go on to something new. But let's go to our next slide. In order to know Jesus, we got to start with the Trinity. All right, so there's the Trinity. There's the Son at the right hand of the Father, and above him in the form of the dove is the Holy Spirit. All right, now, this is what I said in the homily last week. So I'm going to just want to reiterate this because it's good to reinforce. First of all, how how do we see the Trinity? And I use the example to think of yourself. All right, If, if you were like the Trinity, You're one person, but unlike the Trinity, you're three persons, but you really have kind of three components, all right? So when when God the Father speaks, all right, when when, when, when he says something, it's because he thinks. When we think, we speak, sometimes stupidly, all right? That's what gets me in all of my trouble, saying things I shouldn't be saying, dumb things. And so when we think, we speak. If God the Father is the thinker, that's why he's, he's the Father. When he thinks and speaks, we speaks a word. That's why we call Jesus the word, the eternal word. And that son, that is the son, the word, the second person of the Trinity. But I always say this is powered by a breath. The breath is the air. The word for spirit in, in Hebrew, ruah, is air. And that power of the breath that pushes the word is the Holy Spirit. And so remember, the father thinking of himself, he begets the son, not created him, all right? It's the knowledge of God manifested in the word. When you think of something, nobody knows until you manifest it by speaking it. That is what this is. This is why we call the son wisdom, knowledge, because it's the knowledge of God spoken, the spoken word. And then from the Father loving the Son, the love between the Father and the Son proceeds the Holy Spirit. That's all the Holy Spirit is, is he's the love between the Father and the Son. So the love between the Father and the Son, those two persons is so great that from it comes a third person, the Holy Spirit. I've said before, it's like the family. You have the Father, the lover, the wife, the beloved, and the love between them is so great that from it comes a third person, the Holy Spirit. Now, it has nothing to do with gender because God is not human in this sense. In the Trinity, he is spirit. And so the love between God, the Father, and the Son is so great that proceeding from it is the Holy Spirit. Now, from this, this is the Holy Spirit is that love freely given. So this is what makes us human. We're an imitation of God. We're in the image and likeness of God. Why? Because we have knowledge. That's like the Son, S-O-N, spoken by God. We too have knowledge. And what's the Holy Spirit? It's the free will of God, that love, that free love between the Father and the Son. And so we are in the image of God because we have knowledge and free will, that free will to love. We want to love God freely, not be robots. So also, this is the components of a sin. If we sin, we have to have knowledge and free will. If we don't have knowledge and free will, then we, we, we don't sin. And so for having knowledge and free will, for a sin to be mortal, we got to have that knowledge and free will. Then it is done out of our fullness of our humanity. All right, now, all that being said, the other persons of the Trinity, could they have become incarnate? Could the Father have become incarnate? Could the Holy Spirit become incarnate? Could the angels become incarnate? All right, this is interesting. Can only the Son then take on 
the human nature of incarnation. All right. When we say the angels appear, people had written me letters saying, Father, the angels are incarnate. One incarnated before Mary, Gabriel. No, that's not incarnation. That's an appearance. To be incarnate, you have to literally be in the flesh, not appear to be in the flesh. You have to literally have a human intellect and a human will. Gabriel did not have a human intellect and a human will. He was not incarnate. He appeared as a real being. Angels have appeared. It's in the Old Testament. But they're not incarnate. It means that to be incarnate means you take on a full human nature, a full human body, the flesh, human soul, human intellect, and a human will. Yes, that is true. There's nothing intrinsic saying that the Father and the Holy Spirit could not become incarnate. They could do what they want, but they chose not to. And this was fitting. It made sense. It was fitting that it was the Son who became man. Why? Because remember what we said he was? What is the Son? He is knowledge. He is wisdom. And that was the key of the garden. What did Adam and Eve sin in the garden? They weren't, they weren't eating from the tree of life. All my catechism cl class kids thought that Adam and Eve ate from the tree of life. No. They ate from the no tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They wanted to be like God and his wisdom. They wanted to be like God, the second person of the Trinity, the knowledge, the wisdom. So in the garden, man was seeking knowledge. He wanted to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And now God is saying, I will now deliver it to you in the proper way, through my son, not through yourself, but through the Son. God now delivers it in the best way. So the Father is basically saying, let me offer you what you were really seeking in the first place. Knowledge, wisdom. But you were seeking it on your own terms. You wanted to be it. No, you were seeking, but you sought it wrongly. You sought it selfishly. Now I'm going to give it to you in the right way, in the form of my son, who is knowledge and wisdom itself. And you know what's funny? Knowledge and wisdom are the highest gifts of the Holy Spirit. Powerful stuff. So basically, man is perfected in wisdom. Why? Because we're rational, unlike the, will, the animals. Animals have souls. Souls are what makes you alive. Plants have souls. Animals have souls. People are like, Father, that's heretical. No, only man has rational, immortal souls. Animals and plants don't. Man does. We call it the spirit. That's why Paul talks about the spirit. And so this perfection in wisdom is why we are rational. At least we're rational most of the time. <laughs> Sometimes you can be really irrational. By receiving and learning the word of God. And where do we get the word of God? The Bible. Where do we get the Bible? From the church. This is where, it is like the disciple who is instructed by receiving and learning the wisdom of his master. Right? Socrates passed on that wisdom to Plato. Plato passed on that wisdom to Aristotle. This is, this is how it is. God created the world, the world through the word, his thought. And when he spoke the word, the world was created. He spoke it into being. In the beginning was the word. And the word became flesh. So the father was the best, the, or I should say, the best way for the father to repair the world that he created through the word was to send the word again. Remember we said the refrigerator? Who'd be the best person to fix the refrigerator? The guy who made it. God the Father created, right? But how did he create? Through the Son. Through the Word. He spoke it into being. Let there be light. Let it be. Let it be. Just heard that Beatles song on the radio the other day. And it says, Mother Mary came to me. Let it be. Let it be. Mother Mary came to me. Let it be. Let it be. That's basically what God is saying. We're saying a minute here how the words of Mary also brought about creation, a new creation. Fascinating. All right, so the father would best repair his creation by that same very word through whom he first created it. 
That's the second person of the Trinity. That's why it made sense that he was the one who became incarnate, that he was the one to fix it. It is also fitting that the son became incarnate so that we are adopted sons, just like the son of God, the father is the second person. I'm sorry, the son. We then can become adopted sons. We can also inherit the kingdom of the father, just like the son. He's the natural son. Jesus is the natural son of the father, but we can now become adopted sons of the father, right? Now, God is our father, as I said. Jesus is our brother. So don't forget, we need a mother, Mary. All right, so the incarnation makes sense because the redeemer had to be both God and man. This is what I said before. You know, a man could only make satisfaction for himself. I can't necessarily save you. I can't even save myself. Only God can after the fall. So the damage, as I said, was so big. So the Redeemer had to be both God and man. And so this is what we are talking about here. All other gods are just transcendent. None of them would have cared much about us to become one of us. That's the most powerful thing here. Not all religions are the same. No other God would have done that out of love. To Islam, God's a disciplinarian. Never would condescend. Although God doesn't need us, he chose to become one of us out of why? Love. That was the other one on our list, to show us he loves us. That was number two. Wow. Although God doesn't need, need us, he chose to become one of us, as I said, out of love. The basis of humanity for the Jews was the heart. That's why when Jesus became incarnate, he gave his heart. The first thing you think of is the human person of Jesus is what? The heart. The sacred heart. That's to the Jews was the center of the being. The center of the person was the heart. So what does Jesus do? Becomes incarnate. What does he give us? The sacred heart. Why do we Marians focus every first Friday on the sacred heart? Because from it comes the rays of blood and water, the divine mercy. This all ties together. If you have been with us since the beginning of COVID, you can now kind of see this pedagogy of what I've been leading you through in learning what it's like to be formed and, and taught the meaning of our faith. This is beautiful. So no, no, Jesus did not have just a brain. He had a huge heart. At the incarnation, he assumed a truly human heart. All right? Therefore, his heart was filled, filled with the desire not only to love, but also be loved. You ever hear of a broken heart? Jesus has a broken heart. What do we do every first Friday? We make amends to that wounded heart. The sacred heart, this all ties together. This is why we're bringing you what we do. This is why God has allowed us to bring this to you. He has you listening for a purpose, for a reason. You know, God made himself vulnerable. He made himself vulnerable by becoming a human little baby. Just like we need to be loved, and that's why he became man, he needs to be loved as a human. That's why we console the heart of Jesus. That's why on the cross he says, I thirst. I thirst. Now, if you want to hear about that, I just did that last week with Mother Teresa. Our talk last Saturday was all about a heath, I thirst. By quenching his thirst for love and loving him in return, we have mercy on him. You know what Jesus cl clamors for the most he told St. Faustina? Waiting for us to come visit him in the tabernacle. That he sits in that tabernacle all alone. Nobody comes. Can you imagine? That's why I feel so bad for the people at nursing homes and hospitals. When they're all alone and nobody's coming to see them. We have to console the heart of Jesus. That's what First Friday is. Join us. Now let's finish by talking about Mary's role. All right. Now, let's look at our next slide. This is a beautiful painting of Mary. Now, Mary. Don't forget her in all this. Because do you know Mary also spoke 
and it came to be just like God. God said it, God spoke it, and it came to be. Mary said it, Mary spoke it, and it came to be. What am I talking about? Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word, right? Luke chapter one. And with that, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. John 1.14. So when God spoke, all creation came forth. Then when Mary spoke, the God-man came forth. God as man came forth. Creation consented to the word of God, and now we have a new creation, right? God said, let there be light, right, in Genesis, and then he created order, came about, and then that creation said yes through the mouth of a woman. I need to be redeemed, creation says. And through the mouth of a woman, creation cried out, redeem us. And the vessel, the instrumental cause, became the yes of a woman. The true light, listen to this. This is John 1, 9. The true light. So when God said, let there be light, we always think of Genesis, right? The birds and the fish. But listen to John 1, 9. The true light, not even the light from Genesis, let there be light, but the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. Who is he talking about? Jesus. Into Mary's womb. Into time. Into history. Into the world. This is the Annunciation. You know, we rattle off the Hail Marys always so fast. We don't even think about it. But think, look, listen to this. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. You know what that really could say? The Lord is within thee. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is within thee. That's the incarnation. You know? Him whom the heavens cannot contain is enclosed within the body of the Blessed Virgin Mary. That's the church fathers. How about the line of the Hail Mary? Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Well, wait a minute. That's what we just said. Heavens can't contain it within the body of the Blessed Virgin Mary. From it is coming the God-man. We say the words and pray these, but do we hear them? right? Do we hear it? We shall be sons in the Son, partakers of the divine nature, all because God asked Mary and Mary consented. God asked Mary if, if she would consent to bear the Son, and she said yes. It's called her fiat. There's a car in France called fiat. I don't think anybody driving those even realizes what it means. She's the vehicle. Mary is not the goal. She's the guide to get you there. She's the guide to get you to Jesus. So that car that's called Fiat, that gets you to where you want to go, Mary's Fiat gets you to where you want to go. Jesus. All right, every grace comes to us from Jesus Christ. We know this through the incarnation, through God being made man. And that incarnation depended on the yes of Mary, the mother of God. So she's a co Redemptress, co-mediatrix of grace. Not meaning equal, co in Latin means with, cum. So from that yes of the Blessed Virgin Mary, every other yes to God draws its strength. Through the yes of Mary, we today can say yes to God and receive the covenant in the new and everlasting covenant. Through the yes of Mary, the devil is overthrown. Through the yes of Mary, the world is is renewed. Powerful. And the Creator comes. You know, the Annunciation is one of the biggest days of the year because that was the start of our new creation, the day that God sent His Word, a Word which was not to be returned to Him empty, a Word that would come to earth and then return back to Him with us, redeemed. That's the whole meaning of the Mass. You want to see that talk? I have a talk on YouTube called The Meaning of the Mass. And the high point of the Mass is when that priest elevates the chalice and the paten and calls together the whole meaning of the Mass, the whole exitus reditus. Everything came from God. We got broken. Jesus came and fixed us. Now he's taken us back to God, fixed, repaired, renewed, recreated. But when God sent us, he didn't expect his son to come. I'm sorry. 
when God sent his son, he didn't expect his son to come back to him empty-handed. He sent his son so that he could fix us and repair us and then bring us back to God the Father. That's the whole meaning of the concluding doxology. We all came from God, we got broken, we got fixed by Jesus, now we're going back through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the meaning of the Mass. This is everything. He was going to return to the Father, but now redeemed. All right, last couple paragraphs. The Virgin. She became a mother that day. The day of the Annunciation, she became the mother of God. We'll talk about that next week. She became the, they became the mother of the mystical body of Christ. That's why we call her the mother of the church. So we need Mary in this. Our Lord came as this little child because by being human like us, he could begin to take on himself the whole experience of our human condition, except for sin. But he bore the results of that. And our human condition includes having a mother. Whether you know her or not, you have a mother. People say, Father, I did not have a mother. No, you didn't have a mother in your life. Unfortunately, maybe not even your fault. Maybe your mom has passed away. Maybe she abandoned you. And those are all tragedies. That is why our true mother will never abandon us. But every one of you has a mother. Whether or not you know her or not. The sad thing in the world is our true mother, our spiritual mother, most of us don't know. That's the tragedy. So this mother, like the true biological mother, will help provide for us. You could not have survived without your biological mother providing for you, even if she gave you up for adoption, because she gave birth to you. This embodiment of God as a little vulnerable human being, this little child, is the meaning of the incarnation. And I finish with two examples, Faustina and Blessed Michael Sapochko, right here. Let's look at our next slide, St. Faustina. She is one of the saints to whom our Lord revealed his vulnerability, his incarnation. You know, we can begin to understand this because she always saw Jesus as a little child, right? God's purpose in making himself human to reveal to her was his smallness. Listen to St. Faustina, Diary 184. Jesus, you are so little. <laughs> can you imagine St. Faustina looking at Jesus and saying that? And yet I know that you are my creator and my Lord. And Jesus answered, I am. And I keep company with you as a child to teach you humility and simplicity. We just did a filming for the EWTN show on the seven deadly sins. Now they'll start right after the new year. And the very first one is pride. And in that show, we talked about what's the answer to pride, humility. There's not one soul in hell with the virtue of humility and there's not one soul in heaven with the vice of pride. Then St. Faustina in Diary 332 said, I heard a voice in my soul. Meditate on the mystery of the incarnation. And suddenly the infant Jesus appeared before me, radiant with beauty. He told me how much God is pleased with simplicity in a soul. Although my goodness I'm sorry, although my greatness is beyond understanding, I commune only with those who are little. I demand of you a childlike spirit. Wow. This ties to the Mass. Why? Our Lord invites us too to become simple and humble, to go into confession, to be humbled, so that we can receive Him. We come as humble children before him because he allows himself to be continually vulnerable to us in a piece of bread. Let's look at our next slide. This is the mass. This is the mass when he comes to us in the Holy Eucharist under the appearance of bread and wine. But yet, that's only the humble veil. You know, Pope Benedict XVI said, the liturgy reminds us of the original gift of Christmas. He always said this. He always said every Mass is like Christmas because Christ comes to us in the flesh. What is Christmas? Christ coming to us in the flesh. What is the Mass? Christ coming to us in the flesh. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. 
He said, every mass is like Christmas. On that holy night, he said, God becoming man wanted to make himself a gift for humanity. In the mass, he keeps on giving. It's amazing. He took on our humanity in order to give us his divinity. And that is the gift in the mass. The body, blood, soul, and divinity. All right, so that's Faustina. The last one is Blessed Michael Sapochko. I love this. You know, Chris Sparks turned me on to an article. You get your Marian Helper magazine. If you're not, please call us. They're free. But in the 19, October through December issue of 1962, Blessed Michael Sapochko, the confessor of St. Faustina, was still alive. And he wrote an article for us. He was very connected with the Marian Fathers. This is the confessor of St. Faustina, still alive in 1962. And Chris Sparks found that article. And so let's push over the next slide. This is Michael Sapochko. That's Michael Sapochko, the confessor of St. Faustina. Now, this is what's fascinating. His article was called God's Mercy in the Mystery of the Incarnation. This is in our Marian Helper magazine in 1962, as I said. He said, above all, it is through the incarnation that the mercy of God is most clearly revealed. I say it because right on the image, that's the incarnate Jesus. That's the image of divine mercy. Now, he said, God of the Old Testament... You know, we always think of God of the Old Testament as being mean, kind of the ogre, kind of the disciplinarian. And the Jesus of the New Testament is so nice. No, actually, it was the God of the Old Testament who had the mercy to send Jesus in the first place. It was the God of the Old Testament. The Jesus, the nice Jesus of the New Testament was a result of the mercy of the God, the Father of the Old Testament. Both the Old Testament and the New are about mercy. People think just the New Testament is about mercy. It's both. So Michael Sapochko said, it may seem to some that it would have been even a greater act of mercy if all of our sins had been freely forgiven and all men were admitted to heaven. Doesn't that make sense? Okay, so Michael Sapochko is saying, wouldn't it be a greater mercy of God if he just forgave all of our sins and opened the door to heaven and let us all in? Actually, no. No. And he uses the example of a king. If a king takes the status of a servant to save a man who has been condemned to death, he shows more mercy than if he merely spared his life by exercising some decree. All right? It's like a governor. If a governor would just say, oh, I see you're about to die there. Eh, I pass an executive order, you're free. Okay, that is mercy but not to the degree that if he took the guy's place and died for him. What did Maximilian Kolbe do? Maximilian Kolbe took the place. And so this is what it's like if this king takes the status of a servant to save the man who's been condemned to death, he shows more mercy than if he just decreed as a king that you're free, but took his place. By his example, Jesus draws us into the practice of poverty and humility, mortification and purity, obedience and self-denial. There is great humility of the Son of God in the incarnation, he said. Why? Because he annihilated his infinite majesty by taking on his human poverty. Wow, blessed Michael Sapochko. But the fact that this infinite greatness, God took on nothingness, man, in the incarnation, was not due to our own merits. We did nothing. The only thing we did was sin. <laughs> and he said, or for the just evaluation of any good that we had possessed, no. No, not at all. But it was solely on account of the infinite mercy of God that he became incarnate. Hmm. That's mercy. There's no gift that could show the great mercy of God towards human, human misery as well as the gift of God the Father giving his own son. 
giving his son, John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to die in our place. Nothing more could have been done for us. Nothing more efficacious. Nothing more powerful for our salvation. The divine nature. Okay, so I, I wanted to hit this real quick. I just said that no love could have been shown greater than God the Father sending his son to die for us. But did God die? Did God die on the cross? Thomas Aquinas actually says, yes. Yes. Now, the divine nature cannot die. Divine nature cannot die. But a divine person in his human nature did die because of the hypostatic union. I am amazed when Satan mocks God, how he most picks to do it. In the Eucharist, yeah. But do you know I think he picks the most how to mock God? The incarnation. You know why? Because what happened in the incarnation? God the Father gave his son to die. To die for us, to save us. What does Satan twist that? Satan twists that through abortion and human trafficking that you give up your children to Satan, not God. That's why abortion is a satanic sacrifice. Human trafficking is demonic enslavement. So we have God the Father who gave his son to die for us as being mocked by Satan when we as humans give our sons and daughters in abortion or human trafficking. That is Satan completely twisting it. Completely twisting it. This is Satan's greatest mockery of God when we give our children to him. God gave his son to us to live and we give our children to Satan to die. But not so that we can live. We think it is. We think it's so we could live a better life. We think it's so we could live in, in more luxury. Those who seek their life will lose it. Powerful message. You know, the incarnation, according to Sapochko, is the ultimate mercy. The son was not required to be the bread that came down from heaven, the manna, yet he did it out of love for us, that he might reconcile us with the Father and save us. What? an amazing story. The greatest story ever told. And we are living it today. Please get to Mass. Midnight Mass tonight. Christmas Mass tomorrow. We priests say three Masses. Mass at night, which is the Midnight Mass. Mass at dawn, which we do tomorrow, and then Mass during the day. So you can join us tomorrow at 9 a.m., I'll be celebrating the Christmas Mass. I won't be talking about any of this. I have a whole other talk about the Christmas season. And so join us tomorrow at 9 and share with us the grace. You know, that's why I'm always asking to be a Marian helper. So if Brother Mark can show, if you haven't become a Marian helper yet, please do. I, it doesn't cost anything. It takes a couple seconds to sign up. It doesn't cost anything. And I, I've said over and over, I don't care if you ever donate a dollar, you will still get all our prayers. By decree of the Holy See, you'll share in our masses, rosaries, prayers, penances, just like you were marrying priest or brother. That's a great deal, I always say. Because you can keep in the secular world living your life, but yet share in the same grace as I get. I remember Peter in the scripture saying, Lord, what's in it for us? We gave up house. We gave up family for you. What's in it for me? And I kind of look at that saying, Lord, okay, I gave up house. I gave up fiance. What's in it for me? You get the same thing. You get all the graces that we get. That's a beautiful thing. God bless you. And if you'd like to get summaries of some of these talks, the next slide is a DVD called Explaining the Faith. This is several of our talks on DVD. You can get that at shopmercy.org. Or call us at 1 800 4, the number 4, Marion, M A R I A N. 
And two books, if you want to get, I know it's you know, late for a Christmas gift, but you could just blame the shipping company because I think Amazon does overnight shipping now, so you still get it for Christmas. But I don't know if you can or not, but they're on Amazon. They're also on our shop, Mercy. The next book is Understanding Divine Mercy. A lot of the meaning of the mass I explained in that book. You can also get that at shopmercy.org or 800 for marion And then lastly, this is the most sad time of the year for some people. Um, Christmas. Christmas. I know from my uncle when my cousin died in a car wreck. Cousin Dougie, well before me, he was older than me. But my uncle Frank and Aunt Eleanor never really had a, a, a similar Christmas ever again. I never could have a fully joyful Christmas in that sense. And so if you know somebody who's struggling that's lost a loved one, not just a suicide, but any reason, please get this book. If you can't afford it, I'll send it to you. Just contact us. But please, help those who are struggling. And this book, After Suicide, There's Hope for Them and You, is about any kind of loss, any kind of death or separation, not just suicide. And we hope that you too will be able to have a joyful Christmas. Because remember, God's mercy, his ways aren't our ways. We don't understand it until we get to heaven when we understand why God allowed suffering. It's a result of sin, yes, but we'll find out why. And in the meantime, let us hold on with faith. And until next week on New Year's Day, where we'll be here talking about Mary, the mother of God, hopefully you will have a safe and joyful Christmas. And may Almighty God bless you and yours, in the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you and happy, or I should say Merry Christmas, and we'll see you next year for a happy new year. Thank you. God bless you. Modern life has become defined by consumerism, sometimes called consumptionism, in which one's happiness depends on one's quality of life achieved by the attainment of material goods. Many of us are focused on attaining often unneeded material possessions, forgetting about human relationships. As a result, problems arise in our lives that may prove too difficult to overcome. Those who cannot accept the fear and shame of failure may even be tempted to take their own lives. If a man who commits suicide acts out of confusion or ignorance and is therefore not fully responsible for his act, his soul will not be condemned forever by God's perfect justice. He must, however, in a pitifully painful abandonment, wait for his future happiness as many years as he would have waited to die naturally. And then he will only begin to make up for the punishment due to him. <laughs>